the month of Av is very quickly approaching. And of course, the theme of the beginning of Av is Churban Abayis, but the flip side is the Bayis Shlishi. And in a sense, the month of Av and this entire period of time is paradoxical. It's almost antithetical. On the one hand, days of Avelus culminating in Tishabav as we climb higher and higher to intense Avelus, but it's also days of Sasam Vesimcha because these are days that will be transformed into days of joy and happiness with the building of the third Migdash. I'd like to spend some time with you based on the Hegyoni Allah of Rabbi Mirsky to study some of the source material about Binyan Bayashlishi. And we want to know what are we praying for? In fact, we pray at least twice a day in each tefillah for the Binyan Beis Hamikdash, the Yushalayim Ircha Brachamim Tashuv, the Chazen Einenu B'Shuv Chalutziyam Brachamim, and we ask Hashem in His great compassion to bring us back to Yushalayim and to build the Beis Hamikdash, restore the Avoda. And this is something that has three dimensions to it. The first dimension is Bakasha which means that there's meaning and significance inherent in our tefillos, in our bakashas. Sometimes, all too often, we're a little bit laid back and maybe even somewhat cynical about our prayers. We don't realize the power of our prayers. So there's an inherent significance and power within our prayer to bring about the return of Yushalayim, Moshiach, and the building of the third Migdash. But secondly, there's another dimension, which is not so much inherent in the tefillah and its power, but in terms of building up what I call genuine Jewish emotions, the feelings. What are the feelings that a person has to experience as a Jew? And one of those feelings is the longing for the third base of Migdash, for Mashiach, for the ultimate Geula, the redemption. In modern Hebrew, but it's also Lash and Kodesh in Tanakh, it's called Kmiya. Kmiya means longing. And throughout Tfilos, not only are we hopefully bringing about the day or speeding up the process of the day of the Binyan Bias, we're also strengthening and expressing our emotions our kmios, our longings for the Beis HaMikdash. We would not pray over and over again in each tefillah for something unless we really longed for it, unless it was significant to us. It was primary and critical to us. We're missing it. It's gone and we want to restore it. So the tefillahs now play a role almost as a training ground to express and intensify our profound longings for the restoration of the Beis HaMikdash. But there's a third element in Tefillah for the Beis HaMikdash, and Yushalayim Ircha Perachim Tashim. And this perhaps is not only the most significant, but in a contemporary context, plays a tremendous role. And when I say contemporary context, I mean in terms of our claim as the nation of Israel, the land of Israel. Because there are other nations, as you know, and we all have one nation in mind, that claim we have a chazaka on the land of Israel. We've been living here longer than you have. And during the long, bitter Golos, the exile of the Jewish people, other nations have made claim to the land of Israel. Do they have a chazok? And in this context, we want to study a Gemara Baba Basra. And this is called Perek Cheska Sabbat. The Gemara says that if a piece of land, an estate, real estate, is lying fallow. Someone could 
go down to the field, plow it, and plant it, harvest it, market its fruits, and claim that it's his. Does he have a star? No document. He claims it's mine. His proof is the fact that for three years consecutively, he's been exploiting the land, he's been working the land, and no one has made a peep. There was no macha that was heard. The Gemara later on is going to discuss macha itself, a protest on behalf, on, on the part of the Marakab, the original owner, and how exactly you engineer that. Is it enough to register your complaint in front of three people? Do you need 10 people? What, what are the laws and the requirements of Macha? When the nations of the world claim, list them, I tell you. you're a bunch of robbers. You have absconded, you've taken over the land, and you've stolen it from us. We have a chazaka here. What claim? Do you have to ownership? We quote Alex Fields. The fact that we have been praying for thousands of years to return the land to us, to Yushalayim to us, to allow us to build a base on Mikdash, those prayers are the greatest statement of Lonitz Yash. What is a Mechab? Mechab means that I am the real original owner of this field and I never gave up on this field. It could be that I was away, you were here locally, working the land, exploiting the land, marketing its produce, and I didn't say anything. I was away. My silence should not constitute Yeyush. And again, there's a long discussion with Tzos HaChotche and how Yeyush is working, how it would work on Karkos in the event that the original Mamakama, Marakama did not register as Macha. But in this case, no one could claim Yehush. That would be a false claim. Are you telling me that the Jewish people have despaired of ever returning to the land and, and reclaiming it? That's Sheker because And so daily, three times a day, we make a declaration. Our tefillos are the greatest declaration that we have never, ever been misyayish. Thousands of years may have gone by 2000 and whatever since the exile, and yet we are not misyayish. Yayish is antithetical to our prayers. Our prayers are a statement to the contrary. We've never given up, given up, and therefore, no one can claim list them on them. You don't have a star that you claim it's yours. We made a macha. Now here, we're going to raise a question that's a kind of an emotional question. But it seems that this emotional question has bothered the minds of some of the greatest Jewish halachic thinkers throughout the centuries. How is it possible, we ask, that there have been tefillos for the restoration of the Migdash, for the return of Yerushalayim that's been going on for myriads of years? for centuries, for millennia, by some of the greatest Tanoim, Amoroim, and I can go on and on, Gaonim, Rishonim, over the course of centuries. And yet, we are going to pray? We live in the year 2000. We're going we're gonna to be the ones to pray? What is the meaning and the significance? Who are we fooling when we pray for the third base of Nikdash? These prayers have been presented for so many years by so many of our greats, and God has not responded in the affirmative to bring about the restoration of Yerushalayim, the building of the base of Mikdash. And we have the chutzpah of claiming that our tefillos will bring about the base of Mikdash. And we'd like to present today three approaches to this question. The first approach is that of the Ramchal. The Ramchal, in this context, puts on his halachic thinking cap. The Gemara tells us in the Sech de Sukkah, in the famous sugya of 
Lulav Kol Shiva, which is called Zeichel Levikosh. The Gemara says, Minayim. How do you know that we are required to make a Zeichel Levikosh? And the Gemara quotes the Pasuk in Yerbiyah Anavi, Sion, who he, Doresh, Enla. And the Gemara says, Michlal Duboy Drisha. The Torah requires us to pray and petition on behalf of Tzion. We don't have to ask questions about a tzivri, about a mandate, a command that comes from on high. Tzion boy drisha. We are fulfilling our obligation. How God will calculate accepting and responding to our prayers. That's for God. That's not for you. Don't play God over here. You have to fill your obligation and you're responsible to pray for Zio. However, we'd like to suggest another two approaches to this question. And as opposed to Ramchal, these two answers will assume that our feels are in fact meaningful to bring about the building of the base of Migdus, despite the fact that the Greats of Israel have been mispowered for so many centuries without getting a response. First, the Shalah HaKadosh. The Shalah says that we are praying for Geula. Geula means not only redemption, it means salvation, it means protection. Every day is a day of Geula. Every day is a 24-hour period in which we need Geula. We need protection. How it feels may or may not be effective for the ultimate goal, the ultimate Geula, and the restoration of the third Mikdash, perhaps how it feels will not succeed. But one thing we have to testify is that how it feels, but see on, for Yerushalayim, for Eretz Yisrael, for the Gula, are effective on a daily basis. We can accomplish through our tefillos a microcosm, a mini Gula every single day. And I don't have to tell you that not only here in Israel are we facing daily threats of all sorts to our very existence, but all over the world today, in Europe, in America, in South America, there are daily threats to our lives. So our tefillos says the Shalom are meaningful and effective to create a mini Gula for every day onto itself. And now we get to a sefer called the Beis Elokim, which was written by the Marit some six centuries ago. He came from a very important sky of Italian scholars of the Tarani family. And the Mabit writes in Beis Elohim that yes, our Tfilos can accomplish what the early Tfilos of the greats of the centuries could not accomplish. How is that so? How can we have the audacity to claim and believe that our fields will accomplish what the greatest fields could not accomplish. And here the Mabit offers two answers. One answer is based on what I call the theory, the cumulative theory. What happens is that our fields are standing on the shoulders of those prayers that came before us. Every prayer is up there in Shemayim. It is suspended in the heavens. And the more tefillos that go on from generation to generation, there's an accumulation, a tziruf, he calls it, of tefillos. And that's why we're in a better situation than the greats of yesteryear, because we are standing on their shoulders. We are propelling more and more tefillos and standing on the shoulders of those giant Philos of the previous generations. And therefore, in a certain sense, he says, since 
Ribui tefila, ribui, ribui, a myriad of massive fields is necessary to bring about the ultimate ge'ula. And since number two, our tefilos are integrated with the tefilos of yesteryear, then we have more of a chance than they do in a sense because of ribui tefila, the accumulation of tefila. But the Mavic gives another explanation to justify the conclusion that our tefillos can be more effective than the tefillos of years bygone, even those of the greatest leaders of clouds. And in order to appreciate the second explanation of the Mavit, Will will tell a story. You like stories, I hope. This is a story about the Malvin. The Malvin was a great Bala Muna. Many stories about the Malvin's life indicate his faith. But here's a doozy. The Malvin, in his peerage, on Sefer Doniel, predicts the day of Mashiach, the day of what we call the Kate Sayyam. I wouldn't recommend reading it because I think we've passed the date already of the Malvin. <laughs> So that's not good news. But he writes that the kiyum of all the Navuas will take place at some point. He pinpoints it between Tafresh Ayin Gimel and Tafresh Pei Ches. A Leviah would have happened. It would have avoided a lot of tragedy in, in, in Israel. In any event, the Misnagdu, who opposed the Malbim in this effort, quoted the Gemara in Sanhedrin Sadi Zayin. The Gemara says in the name of Shmuel, Tipoch Atzmosov Shal Machash Vekitzen. Shal Yu Omrim, She Yagia Eisa Kates Voloba. And therefore, there are those who believe that if that case that you calculated and predicted did not come about, Forget it. I'm not going to believe chas v'shalom in the kates at all. And therefore, tipei chatzmosom shal machash ve'kitzim. How could you, Adonenu moreinu amalvin, have the chutzpah to tell us when the Mashiach is going to come? That's called machash ve'kitzim. But what I'm more interested in is the Malvin's response. And he gave a marshal. And he said the following. A man, I think it's a true story, a rich man who lived in Poland was on his way to sell his merchandise in the city of Leipzig in Germany. And he hired a coach and he invited his son to join him so that he could teach his son a little bit about the ropes. Ah, a son who goes into the business of his father. That's not necessarily so common. I mean, Harvey is good, but it's, you know. Anyway, just a joke with you. Anyway, they set sail, so to speak. You know, the coach leaves. And it's a long trip. The father tells his son, you got to have a lot of patience. After about a day or so, the son turns to his father. And he says, Ati, when are we going to get there? And his father gets very angry. Where's your patience? Be quiet. We're on the road. Another two days, three days pass. And the child asks him again, Dad, when are we going to get there? When are we going to arrive? I'm getting antsy already. So the Malvin tells him, we'll be there very shortly. So the son says to his father, what happened? The first time I asked you, you got angry at me. You were very impatient. Now I ask you, and you came, you were forthcoming. So the father said to him, it's a simple answer. You don't understand something. When you asked me, we had just set, set our pace. We were long, long, far away from our, our goal, our destiny. And you're already antsy, you're already anxious? Take it easy. But now we've come very close. Within hours, we're going to arrive at our destination. Now you have a right to ask me the question, when are we going to get there? 
And the Malbim used this as a module. He said the earlier Machashve Kates, Chazal knew that in order to be Metakein, all the sins and, you know, the Chetaigo and whatever, it's going to take centuries upon centuries of goals before we can reestablish the third common. But says the Malbim, that doesn't apply to us today. We are already gone through all the exiles, the hundreds and thousands of years of suffering. Enough of it. We got to be close to the Gula. Now we're allowed to be Machash in the caves. And I'm going to use this marshal of the Malbim to give you the insight of the Malbim as to why our Tfilos today could be more effective than those Tfilos of the greatest Tanoim and Amoroim, etc., of years be gone, because our tefillos are closer. It's very difficult to pray for the undoing of a decree of Golos when Golos has just begun and we are so far away from the Gula. But now, says the Mabit, we are so close to the Gula that our tefillos can be more effective. Not because we're standing on the shoulders and we're integrating, as he said in the first answer, but rather because a feel is more effective when you're close to the point in which those tefillos will be accepted. The Ramor writes in Arachayim, Simon Kuf Chaf Gimel, at the very beginning, that we have a minnow to add a short paragraph at the end of tefillah. And that paragraph is all about the bias hashlishi. And he asks the question, why? why? Why was this established as a set minnow? And we say, says the Ramah, because tfilos keneged karbonos tikkun. The whole entity of tfilos is a replacement for the karbonos. The Gemara has two opinions about that. But apparently, and we discussed this last week, we accepted the opinion, and you remember the tour, if we, if we can remind ourselves that the tour says it's just like the Kohen needs a certain kavana when he does the avodah, so to feel you need kavana here too, to replace our karbonos that we don't have today with tefillos. But again, it's not exactly the real thing. We would like to restore the base on Mikdash and get the real thing, so to speak. I sound like an advertiser for what is a Coca-Cola. I don't know. The real thing. We want the original Carbonos. But take a look at the Nusuf that incurred the wrath of some of the Sephardim. He says, that we will be able to build the Beis Hamigdash. The Chida, one of the greatest thinkers, of the last three centuries of Sephardic Jewry, quotes a comment of the Maram di Lunzano. Di Lunzano. Let's not forget his name. And the Maram says that the Ramah is mistaken about the Nusuf. It should not be Yehi Ratzon Shei Bonabes Amigdash, but Ti Bonabes Amigdash, which means it will be built. It would be built in heaven. And the Maram quotes a Pasuk in Tehillim, Im Hashem lo yivne bayis, which is a reference, an allusion to the Beis HaMikdash HaShlishi, Shav Amolo Bonimbo. And therefore he says, I would never say she bone, which is mashma that somebody, some human being will build the Beis HaMikdash. I would say Shetibana, it will be built, meaning up in Chamai. And as we'll see in a minute, there are two Nutzchals. The Ashkenazim say Yibana, the Sephardim say Tibana, up until this day. However, I want to focus your attention on the assumption of the, of the, Mar the Maram Dilon Zano. Because I'm not absolutely convinced that the third base of Migdash is going to come down from the heavens. Although, that's what it says in the Yalkut Shemoni Parshish Mishpatim. It's also implicit in the Gemara Baba Kama. 
He takes a H. Shalim Yishalim Amavers of the Eira. In Parshim Shpotim Omer Kodesh Baruch Ani Tzati H B'Tzion. I lit the fire that destroyed the first Migdash, the base of Migdash. Shenever Yotzeis Pasigin Eicha. H B'Tzion Ani Osid Liv Nosa the H. I have to pay my compensation because I, says the Almighty, destroyed the base of Migdash. I now have to bring back. And restore the base on Migdash. So that's fine. That's a wonderful support for the claim of the Maran, the Lanzano. But not every statement of Chazal seems to reflect that opinion. In fact, in the in the Medrash Rabba. But Parshas Vayikra, the Torah says very explicitly that Migdash Ha'asid Shana Mitzapim Bonu Bonu Mushuchal Hu, meaning the Mashiach Yigala, he will reveal the Migdash, he will build the Migdash. And if you take a look at the Lashem of Vayikra Rabba. He says, "Mama Kain, Rabbi Loza, Lekiria, there, Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Uri, Tzafon, Melech Moshiach, and Nosan B'Tzafon, Yavo V'Yivne, Beis Hamikdash, and Nosan B'Dara." And the Rama Midilfus Melachim in this in the eleventh chapter writes, "How Melech Hamoshiach Asid Lamod Ulahachzir Malchus Beis David Liyashat Liyashna and Bone Hamikdash Umekabeitz Nidche Yisrael." The Rama is outspoken. That it's the Melech HaMashiach who build the base of Migdash. Our Nusuch in Nachem on Tishabov seems to support the view of the Yalkut in Parshas Mitzvotim that it's Hakon Shbarach who will build the Migdash. Because it says, Migdash, Kiato Hashem, Beish Yitzato, Beish Atasid, Livnosa. Livnosa, you will build the Bayesh Lishan. And perhaps we now see that there's a major plukta here, a machlokas, as to how the Bayashlishi will come about. Is it going to fly down from heaven like a fire? Or will the Melech HaMashiach, as a human effort, build the Beis HaMikdash? And based on these two opinions, we can perhaps justify the Chimuke Nuschos between the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim. The Ashkenazim and there are more at the head of the, of the group, say, which means that we will build the base on Migdash through the Mashiach. But the Sfaradim will say, it will be built by HaKadosh Baruch, reflecting the Shita of the Yalkut in Parshas Mishpatim that the Almighty will build the third base of Migdash, and as we saw, the Nusach in Nachim seems to support that. Perhaps you could say that even according to the Nusach of the Ramah, Yibane doesn't mean Al Yidei Adam. Maybe Yibane could mean through Akadosh Baruch It's possible. However, a number of different commentaries have tried very hard to reconcile the approach or the opinion, if you will of the Alkut Shimoni Mishpatim with that of Vayikra Rab. And at the leadership here is that of the Maram Shik. Maram Shik suggests that in order to appreciate these two opinions and these two approaches to the Bayas Hashlichi, we should study a Gemara in Sanhedrin on Daft Tzadiches. The Gemara is trying to understand what it considers a contradiction in a puzzle in Sefer Yeshayo Perek Sam. The Gemara says as follows. The Pasuk in Yeshaya Perek Sam says, HaKaton Yela Elf, HaTzair Goya Tzum, a lot of he says, Ani Hashem be'ita achishem. 
in its time, I will speed it up. Om Rav Alessandria, Rabbi Yeshua Roman, Astira, Ksiv Ita, in its time, Uksiv Achishena, I will speed up the process. Basasri Adobi, says the Gemara, there are basically two approaches to the Geula and when it's going to come about. Zahu, if let's say we're on a higher level and we reach unexpected heights in spirituality, in mitzvahs, in Torah study, achishenu. I'm not going to wait, says God, <clears throat> until the appointed moment. I'm going to bring it early. I wonder if we were Zohar to them. But lo Zohar, then Be'ita, it's going to happen at a certain time. So God has it written up in Shemayim. It's inscribed when the Kates is going to happen. And that's when the Gula is going to take place. No question about it. But that's only the latest time that'll take place. It could be Achishenu, and we can speed up the process if Zahu, if we really exceed the, the expectations. When the Rambam talks about Melech HaMashiach, which means that the Migdash will be built the day Adam, that's called Be'itam. That means that God has a set date, and on that date, the Mashiach will build the Beis HaMikdash. However, there's another possibility that will be Zohar to Achishena, to a Gula that will come before its time. And that, he says, will come totally be Deshamayim. That will be the Mikdash Ashlishi about which we say the Mehera Tibana. The Migdosh Bidei Shammai. Now you might ask, according to the Maram Shik, what's the logic that if it's Bichicheno, it's going to come from Shammai? And I think the answer is that Bichita is based on human efforts. The set time that's inscribed up in Shammai is according to the natural order of the universe, where man plays a role. And therefore, it makes sense that Be'ita, it will be through human efforts. If on the other hand, you're talking about Achishena, that's totally a divine redemption that's brought about by the divine being. However, the Aruch Laner, we find to quote, in his commentary on Sukkah, has another approach to Elu V'Elu Dibali Kim Chayim in this context. He says, there's no question that the Ramam is right. The Migdash HaShlishi, Liyasid Lava, will be, bought, will be built by man, by human efforts. But the Pasuk says in Shira, in the Shira Sayyam, it says, Migdash Hashem Konenu Yodech, which indicates that the Migdash will come down from Chomayim. He says the following. There are two dimensions to the Migdash. There's the physical base of Migdash, the edifice, the structure, and then there's the spiritual vision of the base of Migdash. And it's going to be a unification of both of these elements. The truth is, even before I saw the Orkhan there, I didn't spell it out, but I had it somewhere in the back of my intuition that this could be the answer to reconcile the two. There's a vision, call it the Migdash of Mal, if you will. He doesn't use that term. And that spiritual vision is it's completely divine. And he compares it, the Yorchan there, to what the Gemara says in Yoma, that there's an H, Mina Shemayim, that comes down to burn up the Karbanos. But yet, that's not what burns up the Karbanos. Because Mitzvah of the Yom we have to bring the fire and light the fire on the Mizbech. We don't rely on the Eish Min HaShamayim. The Eish Min HaShamayim is the Beis HaMikdash HaShlishi, the spiritual Beis HaMikdash. Not physical and material, 
that's going to come down from Shemayim, and it's going to enter into the physical structure, and together we will have an integration of both Mina Shemayim, the Ruchni, and the Gashmi, the physical that man will build. And therefore, the Neshama, if you will, man is made up of Neshama and a goof. The goof of the base Hamikdash will be created by man, as the Raman points out, the Melch Mashiach, but the Neshama will enter into that goof, Mina Shemayim. I'd like to share with you a beautiful insight of the Maril Diski. And he comes to answer a kasha of the Siach Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak Molson, who was an outstanding disciple of the Gon and wrote a commentary on the Siddur Agra. If you get hold of a Siddur Agra, then in all likelihood, you will see a commentary on the side called the Siach Yitzchak or Yitzchak Malin. Malton, sorry. He asks about the Nutzach that we repeat every regal at Sholosh Megolim, Veharenu Bibinyano, Vesamchenu Bitikuno. And he works with the premise. You can question this premise if you like, that the Nusach HaTfila coming from the Anchi Knesset Dola is not just poetry. It is that. But it's not just flower, flowery language that repeats itself with eloquence without any additional significance. And just like we read a Mishnah and we wonder why the Mishnah repeated itself, Omer, Echtev Yashiv, Echtev Yashiv, if you're familiar with today's now. So too, why the repetition? And not only that, he's bothered by the following. When it comes to the binyan of the base of English, it says, Har'enu, show it up. When it comes to the tikkun, which again, ostensibly means the same thing, right, when we're talking about there it says, Samchenu b'tikkunu, which seems to go beyond Har'enu b'binyanu. So, to summarize the questions of the Siach Yitzchak, question number one, why the double language? Question number two, what's the difference between Harenu and Aknenu? What's the difference between Harenu, Bibinyano, Samchenu? What's the difference between Harenu and Samchenu? And why Samchenu, Bitikuno? Fast forward. My guess is about 50 years, and we have the Maril Diski. It's a beautiful answer. One of my favorites. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Maybe you heard of him. The Maril Diski is bothered by the following question. The Torah says, We also we migdosh in Shachanti Mesopha. And the Rambam codifies this in Hilchas Beis Abachira, the Asuli Migdosh is a mandate, one of the 613, that we will build the Beis HaMikdosh. And every Kiyom HaMitzvah brings us to a state of Simcha. And yet, according to one opinion in Chazal, as we've seen, the, the Yalkut in Mishpatim, in, in, in Mishpatim and other sources, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to bring down the third base of Migdash, complete. So if that be the case, we are in a sense, pardon the expression, robbed of our Kiyum mitzvah and our Simcha of the Asuli Migdash. To answer this question, he asks another question. The Pasuk in the second chapter of Echa says the following, Tavu Ba'aretz She'arel. As I'll say that the She'arim, the gates of the Migdash, did not go up in flames, but rather they sunk down, as I'll call it Gniza, in the Mokoma Migdash. Very nice. What does it mean? Says if I will diskin, if I is going to bring down the Migdash complete. 
What does it mean? And furthermore, Chazal say on that same pasuk, that Leosid Lobo, the Zekanim of the Dar, are going to know exactly where the Sha'arim are buried, and they're going to bring them up from up from the bottom. That makes sense if you hold like the Rabbah Shit to that bit. That Mashiach is going to build the Mikdash Shlisha. But if you hold like the Shir, the Yalkut Shimoni, that it's going to come down from heaven. So why are we bothering? First of all, why bother with the Geniza of, of, of the Sha'arim? And why bother with the great dramatic Zekanim that can bring it up from underground? And he asks, answers these questions with one yisod. He says the following. The Gemara says in Baba Basra, on Dafnud Gimon and Babes, regarding Nitzay Ager, which is really Hefker, if Ruven comes and builds a structure, but he does not build the gates, and Shimon comes and he puts the gateways, the entranceways, then Shimon is Kona and not Reuven, because a structure without gates is worthless. It's not a binion. Says the Maril Diskin. Now everything fits into place beautifully. Yes, the Migdus is going to come down from high, according to that sheet. But there won't be any gates. There won't be any entranceways. No doors, no, no Sha'arim. The Sha'arim are buried below the ground. And we are not happy because we didn't get the opportunity to fulfill the mix of building the mix. But the answer is that the Zakanim will bring from the submerged state the Dlossos of the base of Mikdash. And we will establish those doors and those Sha'arim in the Mikdash Ashlichi. And now it's considered as if we built the base of Mikdash. And that's the Pshat. Harenu Bibinyano. God, show us this binyan. Let's see it coming down from Shemayim. But some chenu b'tikuno. Tikuno means that we will complete the process. We'll do the final tikkun. We'll set up the sha'arim of the Beis HaMikdash. Therefore, it's some chenu b'tikuno. And that's the great simcha that we'll have that we were able to complete the Beis HaMikdash. And again, on a philosophical level, you have to always ask why the two and then we go back to the Arach Laner, that is the combination of divine uh, contribution together with the human contribution. But at the end of the day, the Mak of Apatish, the Kenyan, and the Kiyum is ours, is in the hands of man, the Asuli Migdash, because some Chenu Kuna will set up the Shi'orim of the Beisam. To quote the Zera Kodesh of the Rapshisa, this is a Hasidish of Vard, but it's a very beautiful and profound idea. Yes, it's true that the Migdash will come down from Shemayim, but it's built from Shemayim through Klal Yisra. What does that mean? And he says the following, our tefillos, our mitzvahs, will build the base of Migdash, not physically, but spiritually and metaphorically. Every time a Jew does a good act, he adds something to the binya, the conceptual binya to the base of Mikdash. He writes that some people on a daily basis can build an entire shura, a whole line of, so to speak, the bricks and the and the Yavanim of the base of Mikdash. Another person, okay, he didn't achieve that level, but he puts down one levena, one brick. And so, with the course of time, there's a binion of man, of Klal Yisrael, down here, through our service of Hashem. Every day, we are moving towards the Shlemus. We are getting closer and closer to the Migdash that would be built from here of Yomena, from all these different shuros and all these different levenos that we have set up and created through our, our mitzvos, our meisim tovim, our Torah. And that means that we view on a conceptual basis that our activities, our mitzvos, are actually participating in the building of the Beis HaMikdash. And he adds that, Srichem Anu B'chol Yom V'yom, L'hosef Mi'at Min Abinyan. And based on this, he wants to explain the Chazal, Mishal Nivna Beis HaMikdash B'yomov is Milo Lava Kosekilu Nechrav B'yomov. 
you have such a great opportunity with a myriad of mitzvahs to build the base of Mikdash. And if you fail to take advantage and exploit that opportunity, you are in effect bringing about the Churma. And now we could talk about Zechel of Mikdash and Zechel of Churma. The Rav of Yushalayim back before the establishment of the state was of Chaim Yosef Zadenfeld. Yosef Chaim Zadenfeld. Of course, Palestine was under the British mandate at that time, and there's a, a certain very, very high officer in the British military whose name was Roberts. And I'm sorry, his name was not Robert, but Herbert, Herbert. And he came on a visit to the land of Israel. And when he arrived in Palestine, he asked if he could meet the chief rabbi of Jerusalem. And Rabbi Yosef Chaim decided that that's, that's fine. He doesn't mind hosting this great leader of the Brits, this Herbert, his last name was Samuel. However, Rav Yosef Chaim was very sharp. He agreed to the meeting, but only on one condition that he would host him, his esteemed guest, in his own house. Rav Yosef Chaim Sonnenfeld, many stories about the fact that he lived in the old city, which was in itself very dangerous at that time. And he actually had a view of the Makam Migdash. However, the house was a Shrek, was in shambles. I don't know, gentlemen, if you've ever been to any house in Mea Sha'arif, you can still see probably a little bit of a view of what the house of Yosef Chaim Zonfeld looked like. So they pleaded, the Jews were pleading with the Rav to allow them to do a shiputz, to fix up the place, maybe put down a floor in honor of this great visit of Herbert Samuels. And he refused. And he says that my house is my house and this great esteemed officer can come if he likes and visit me in my home. When the man comes in, we'll call him Sir Herbert. You can see on his face immediately, what is it over here? The rabbi is living in such a run-down, dilapidated house? How can the Jews treat their rabbi in such a hashpala, in such a low way, allowing him to live in, in, in such shambles. Rav Zonenfeld, without waiting till the question would be raised, but intuiting that that was the question in the mind of this Sir Herbert, he takes this British officer and he brings him closer to the window. And he asks the officer, what do you see when you look out the window? He says, I see the Western Wall and it's surrounded by piles and piles of rubbish. Because that's what the Goyim did with the Western Wall. That's what the Arabs thought of the Western Wall. Throw the garbage there. So Rabbi Zodenfeld answers in response. He says, God rests here on the Western Wall. And if he's willing to live in such shambles with rubbish piled up in all ways, I certainly can live in that kind of state.
The balance of this essay is about the Kruven. And as you know, the Kruven sometimes faced outwards and sometimes inwards. And there are steers in the Psukim and the Gemara in a number of places raises this stira. Is it Panim Ishal Achiv or Panim Labayis? And the Gemara says the following, which you'll see on the bottom of page 470. And therefore, initially, when they created the Kruvim, it was Panim El Panim. And that's the Hasha Shina of Yisrael. Kisha Enam Osim Ritzon Hashem Lakom, Haya Kruvim Hofchim Es Pneim, they miraculously turn outwardly. La Horos, the Ata now, Ena Kodeshbach Imoem, Bechiba. That now we're not on good terms. And the Ritva is very famous in the Sugi and Yuma on Daphne Dalanam in Beis. What is going on? How can Reish Lakish say that when the Goyim came in to destroy the Mikdash, they saw the Kruvim that were embracing each other? Because we deviated, that's why the Mikdash was destroyed. How from Rav Kulitz, Rav Yitzchak Kulitz, who was at that time the chief rabbi of Yushalayim, he says, Mashal you akruvim mafnim pneim el abayis kshelo asur etzor shel makom hoyuz es siman rak biyachasim shebein am Yisrael akadosh baruch hu bishvil sheyadu shaleim moshe b'tshuva. This was a sign that was sent by Almighty God that the people have to do tshuva. And God is as if saying, I'm turning away. When it comes to our relationship with the Goyim, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu is always Tamid Bechiba in Klal Yisrael. And therefore, Kshenichnesu HaNochim Lehechel, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent a message, not to the Jewish people, but to the Nochim, that you should know, Chavivin Yisrael Lefanai, and that's why Hashem wanted to send a message to the Nachim that they should know that Chaviv in Yisrael the fun. I just wanted to add here at this moment, I don't know if you know this, but lately I've been studying, I think I told you this, Summer of Nassim's Torah. Rav Nassim was the disciple of Nachim. And he wrote extensively eight volumes on the Shulchan Aruch, but it's not a commentary really on the Shulchan Aruch. It's a jumping off point to Hashkafic discussions. And he raises the following question. How is it that after the three-week period of intense mourning, we build up gradually from the 17th of Tammuz during Ben Mitzorim, and we reach the crescendo on Tisha B'av, and immediately after Tisha B'av, Nacham. Moreover, even on Tisha B'av itself in Mincha, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami. I'm saying, I'm sorry, we recite Nacham. And Chazal say that sometime in the afternoon, Moshiach was born. What is going on here? We're at the sea, how do you say, the epitome, the pinnacle of our avails, the crescendo, 
the most profound level of Avelis of Tishba. We don't put on tefillin. There's no celebration over here. And then, in one fell swoop, almost, he says, I would have expected that we should continue the Avelis after Tishba, maybe gradually coming down from them. But in one sharp fall to go from Avelis in his crescendo, most intense Avelis, to the state of Nachamo, of Nachamo. And he says the following. What brings about Churban is when we deviate and we don't fulfill the will of God. And it gets darker and darker in the light of the Migdash. The Migdash becomes a very dark place as it reflects the fact that we have deviated and not lived up to our obligation. And in the language of the Navi, Aloatem Bnei Kushiyim I don't want any sound, any, make any statement that sounds racial, but what do you mean Bnei Kushiyim? Bnei Kushiyim, where the black is beautiful, it's hopeful, but it's definitely a nation of the world. You know, we're not Africans, we are Jews. And how can the Navi compare us? To the Kushir. And he answers the following. That there are two systems of judgment. There's one judgment between God and the Jewish people. We are expected, because of our very high origins as Shrashim, to live up to the ideal. And sometimes we fail to realize that that which we justify as a very small deviation and it shouldn't be much, but compared to the ideal that Akash Baruch has in mind for us, we are far from that ideal. We're, we're very deficient. We're not living up. But there's another standard of comparison. Not comparing the Jew to himself. Not comparing the nation of Israel to its potential. But rather comparing Israel to the nations of the world. And no matter how low we get, dark, dark, deep, into the blood of, of, of hate and the darkness that will bring about the destruction of the Migdash, compared to the Goyim, we are doing excellently. And he says that the Posse in Tanakh tells us that as soon as God lit the fire to the base of Migdash, through the Shluchim of the Nachrim, Immediately, the Goyim turn to the people of Israel and they say, Halo atem goyim. You're like all the nations of the world. What's different about you? You had a base on Migdash that's going up in flames. All of a sudden, the shift of comparison, now in the light of the comment, the cynical comment of the Goyim, now our Kodesh Baruch Hu says, Who are you? You're trying to rip it into the Jews. You're the lowest of the low. You're animals in the form of human beings. This is my beloved chosen nation. They are infinitely greater than you are. And when God says those words, the guy who say, oh, you're like all of us, you're B'nai Kushian, then at that point begins the turning point of Nechama. The Nechama is in the greatness of Kali Israel as beloved people of, of HaKadosh Baruch. And that's what we see here in the Machna Yitzchak. And he's saying that what the Ritva means when he explains that Dafka, when the Nachrim come in, the Kruvim, or Ma'urim, said that's it. Says that's because at this point in time, there's a shift in the comparison. Hashem is not comparing comparing us to what we could be at this point, but rather to the goyim. And he's sending a message to the goyim. You should know that as much as you want to rip it into Klal Yisrael and lord it over them and say, "Look, here you've been rejected. Where's your God? Where's the love? Look at the base Hamikdash that's up in flames. You are absolutely wrong." The Kruvim Ama Urim because relative to the Goyim, we are infinitely more powerful 
and more pure and spiritually great than the nations of the world. I just want to end with this little bit of a story here that he tells on page 472. I'm skipping some major chunks, but we're running low on time. And he speaks about one of the great Jews that was killed by the Nazis, Yemach Shimon, Rabbi Avram Tzvi Kamoy, one of the outstanding products of the Lithuanian yeshivas, a great lamb. And it seems that Rabbi Avram Tzvi Kamoy had his favorite bookseller, maybe on Bathurst Street, I don't know where it was, anyway. And he always bought Sfarim from this bookseller. And he paid full price, never, you know, never tried to squabble over the price. One time, <clears throat> he <clears throat> entered into a debate, so to speak, a give and take with the seller. It was Erev Tishabov, and he came in to ask for Megillus Echo, which means Kinos. And it was a small sum of money, very inexpensive. And Rabbi Avram starts quibbling with him over the price. So the Mokhar's farm says to him, Rabbi, I don't understand. You've been buying Svarm for me for years, spending lots of money on Svarm. I never heard you debate with me back and forth about the price. I'm charging you a pittance, a very relatively small amount for a book, and you're all of a sudden trying to negotiate with me on the price? So we have Ram Tzvi said to him, you don't understand. Every safer that I bought from you will last me for a lifetime, but this safer will last me for 24 hours because after Tisha there's no need for kinnas. By next year, we'll have the base of Mikdash Hashlishi. And I just want to add one little idea Rav Soloveitchik once told us. We used to go uh, to Boston for the summer, but then we would stay with him to Tichaba. And he once told us that the middag in his shtetl and litter was that at the end of Tichaba, they would bury the kinnas. Today, you can get you know, beautifully bound art scroll kiddies that'll last you for the next, I don't know how long, but uh, that's a different spirit. So this is our Muna. We started our discussion today with the faith that we never was Messiah, we never gave up, we're still making Macha, we will be returned to Yerushalayim, our tefillos are meaningful, and that faith has to carry us through Tisha B'Av. From Tisha B'Av of Avelus to Tisha B'Av of Sasan Vesimcha, of Nechama. And therefore, when we indicate that we don't want to spend too much money on Kinnis, it's not that we're being stingy. I mean, of Kamoy spent lots of money on Svam, never quabbled about the price. But the point is, it was a statement of Amun of faith. He wrote some of his will that we see through our tefillos, and the Mabit says that we are in a better position than the Gedolim who came before us. Through our tefillos will be so good to see Ertz Hashem, the restoration of the Beis HaMikdosh, whether it's Yibane or Tibane, Bim Heir of Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Next week, I'd like to go on to another topic, if it's okay with you in the Agyoni Alofa. He's got chapters and chapters on the mitzvah of tshuva, and specifically vidu Yom HaKippurim, and maybe I thought that would be, at least for one year, maybe an interesting topic. So hopefully I'll take out my... Brizan, yeah. just a, a you can't get a hold of it. Yoni I've been looking. I don't know what to say. I, I'm sure you'll find kiddos on Eftishima, but not at Yoni <laughs> Uh, Friday, I, don't just... know. I don't know what to say. I, maybe up north, maybe, maybe you know, over there in the Bay. Think, is there a farm store over there? Maybe they would have it. Well, my 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 son is coming from Lakewood soon, so maybe from there they'll have it. I don't know. 
I'll check it out. But it would really save me a, a great deal of work. But, but okay, you know, I want to thank David, as I always do, for, for doing the work of sending it out. And uh, I don't know, Joe mentioned to me, I don't know, you'll, you'll discuss it amongst yourselves and maybe if you got it a little earlier, it would be easier for you to print it out. I don't know. I don't know if David has the time for that. I, I can try to send it to you early. Possible. Hey, just a couple of uh, comments. Yeah, if, sure. uh, I could stop the recording, I guess. Not, All uh, right. If you want, not, I'll do that. Are not. Uh...